Now, yesterday I started on something that I wanted to just spend a few minutes to finish because I didn't finish it. How many of you remember yesterday's sermon? Yes, praise the Lord. I would recommend that if you're serious about growing in the spirit, as a minister, get yesterday's sermon. Of course, I've announced, but I'm sure not many of you are going to take it. Praise the Lord. Not many of you are going to what? Take it. But the few of you who are serious about becoming ministers of the gospel, get yesterday's sermon because it is part one of this part. Hallelujah. And I said things yesterday that are important to carry on from this part for you to perhaps get a bigger picture of, 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 of why we are here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Get yesterday's sermon at any price. If you don't, Hallelujah. It's up to you. Praise the Lord Jesus. Now, Acts 20, 26. I want to begin from there because I was, that's where I almost ended. Now I want to continue from there and then probably finish what, what I was supposed to finish in these few minutes. Father, we thank you for this afternoon. We thank you that we are drawing into your word tonight and something is about to happen in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's read Paul. One, two, three, let's go. He says, Wherefore, I take to you to record this day that I am pure of, from all men, from the blood of all men. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, Wherefore, I take to, to your record, or I take you to record that this day that I am pure from, from the blood of all men. Uh -huh. For I have not shunned to declare the unto you all the counsel of God. Hallelujah. And when I was ending toward the end, I mentioned that when Paul says that he's pure of all men's blood, that God cannot hold him accountable of any man's blood lost. He carries that confidence of not being accountable of any man's blood lost because he has revealed to all men all the counsel of God. If all the counsel of God is not coming out of Paul, there is a place where he's accountable of certain men's blood. And that means that the blood of men is against the counsel of God. The deeper the counsel of God, the more accountability toward the lives of men. Because the counsel of God, read Revelation, the book of Greek, the Greek translation, or the literal root meaning of the word Revelation is defined as God's redemptive power. What we preach toward men has to create a line of redeeming them. And the place of redemption here, if you're dealing with a new creation, is different from the place of redemption if you're dealing with an old nature. The old nature and part of the old man which was in you, in the need of redemption, needed redemption from sin. The Bible says that he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, by whose stripes we were redeemed. So the place of the old man in the purpose of redemption primarily was that man would be free from sin, the dominion of sin, the power of sin, the influence of sin. That sin doesn't have power over you, that sin does not have dominion over you, it cannot control you, it does not have you anymore. But when you became born again, you became a fruit of redemption. The redeemed man died. When the Bible says that when he died, we died. That place of you that died was the man that was redeemed. After redemption, praise the Lord Jesus Christ, that man died in the Christ when the Christ was dying. So when the Bible says that, wherefore we are buried with him by the baptisms into death, just like Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so that we should also walk in the newness of life. The place of him dying, when he died, we died with him is a place of the old nature because remember that particular point your salvation was not complete your salvation was complete by the death and resurrection if jesus had not been raised from the dead the story would have not been complete Say amen so when salvation when when resurrection comes of the christ that place of resurrection now produces you in the newness of life a new creation in christ jesus the old is past and now the new and all things are of god praise the lord now, because all things are of God, it means that the new creation is a new, is, is begotten after the, the, the line and life which is of God. 
that new creature is born a life infallible and the life which is of God, Paul calls that born of the incorruptible seed, which is the word of God in living and abiding forever. So because this seed is incorruptible, that new creation in you cannot be corrupted. The old man which was corruptible was redeemed and then died because if God didn't kill that man, that man would still be corruptible. So he needed to get an eternal line of incorruptible in your life and that presupposed that he had to produce another spirit, another person. That is why it's called born again. It's called born again. And that is why I want to submit to you there are people who are saved but they are not born again. <laughs> they all look the same but they are not the same. What do I mean by that? The Bible says that he died for our sins. And not only ours, but he's the propitiation of the sins of the world also. Jesus saved the world. But the world has an opportunity to accept him. When they do, they become born again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It doesn't mean that he did not save them. No, he did save them. But they have the right to accept it or say, me, I don't want your salvation. It's available. That salvation is available for every man. Every man has access to salvation, but not every man is born again. Say amen. amen. So, some people say, I am saved, but are they really born again? Because if you're born again, you're born of an incorruptible seed. Hallelujah. So, when we go to the place of redemption primarily for the man which is in the old nature, God is dealing with the sin principle. When he kills that sin principle and the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, now he brings out a new spiritual man, which is the new creation, you born of the incorruptible seed, which means you can't wake up and be corrupted. So if you should see corruption in you, you have not yet grown into the knowledge of what it means to be incorruptible. You, you get my point? So when that man is incorruptible now, when we define redemption in the new creation, it is not to the attesting of us working with the nature, because that nature is already perfect in Christ Jesus. And the Bible says that you are complete in him. The Greek word there is perfection. You are perfect in him, which is the head of all the church. You are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. You are complete in him. You don't need to be Baptist. No, you are complete in him. You don't need to be Anglican. No, you are complete in him. You don't need to be four square full gospel. No, you are complete in him before you become Pentecostal. Before you become charismatic, before you become born, before you become uh, this or that, you are complete in him before you protest. So we want to get the body of Christ to a place where religious affiliations and the umbrellas are not the important thing. We want to get to the point where the important thing is the Christ. That life of Jesus inside you and me, that's more important. That should connect me and you more than the umbrella under which I sit or the affiliation under which you want to relate me to. But the world has forgotten the completeness that we carry in Christ and they think that I am going to be complete because I've sat under a certain umbrella. I'm going to be complete because I've gone with a certain group of men of God. I'm going to be complete because I belong to this ministry. No, even if you don't belong to heart of Christ, you are complete. <laughs> and there is no place of you being disqualified because you don't pray with us. Ah. That is the place where we are carrying the unity of the faith. But also, it's a bit indifferent. Are you hearing me? It's a bit indifferent when you don't understand that completeness. When you don't understand that completeness. Hallelujah. So there is a place where the perfection of God in the old, in the spirit of man is there. But the places of imperfection only dwell in the soulish realm and the bodily realm. The flesh and the soul are not perfect, but the spirit is perfect. Why? Because it's incorruptible. It is one with the Lord. He that is joined with the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. So it cannot have a oneness, but yet have a diversion of operation. Spirits of men are perfect. But the places where we wrestle with is the place of the soul and the flesh. And we, by the spirit, the Bible says, you kill the transactions of the body, you will live. He says, if you live by the flesh, you will die. 
If you live by the flesh, you will die. If you live by the flesh, you will die. If you live by the flesh, you will die. I repeat it many times. If you live after the flesh, ye will die. But if you through the spiritual man, which is incorruptible, do mortify or kill the deeds of the body, you shall live. That means that the alive part of you which is incorruptible is the spirit man. His ministry is to kill the evil in the soul and in the flesh. That is how you live. But if you live according to the flesh, you what? You die. Meaning you incline yourself to the workings of the flesh instead of the strength which is of the spirit which is in you. Because in you is the treasure in us and vessels. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. In you is the life which is of God. In you is the indwelling power and life of Jesus Christ. That is the same Jesus which says, and this is love made perfect, that we might have confidence on that day for as he is, so are we in this world. That is the same Jesus in Colossians who says this was the mystery which was hid from the ages past and now revealed Christ in us, the hope of glory. He doesn't live separate from your spirit. He lives in your spirit. And that he that liveth in your spirit works in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. He is perfect. Say amen. Say amen. amen. Now let's go deep. So when we are dealing with a place where we try to redeem, we define redemption in a new creature setting. We're not dealing with a nature issue on the man. We're dealing with a timing issue of the creature. That's why Paul says, let us redeem the time for the days are evil. The place of redemption for a new creature is not to that creature, but it is for the time for the creature. Because remember, creation, the Bible says, groans and, 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 and what? Travails for the manifestation of the true sons of God. You said that as if you're very gender sensitive. You understand? But it's one and the same. So when the Bible says that the honest expectation of creation waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God, what time are they going to manifest? So that is a place where we redeem time. How do we do it? We go in eternity, align ourselves to truth, and that truth infallible is pulled from the eternal substance and it's thrown into the earthly plane into the hearts of men and when it is put into the hearts of men it creates the ultimate urgency for men to realign themselves to divine purpose and the will of God concerning their lives because if they do not avail themselves regardless of the giftings and callings of God upon their lives God will choose another help comes from anywhere but divine purpose must be fulfilled say amen so when we are dealing with that kind of experience we deal with, 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 with the things that we must know because of what's upon our life. Now let me take it back to Paul. When Paul says that I'm accountable or I'm pure of all men's blood because I've revealed unto them all the counsel of God, it means that Paul would be accountable if all the counsel of God was not revealed to men. The judgment on Paul... <laughs> would not be that he lied and stole. The judgment on Paul was, there is a person who died because he did not reveal all the counsel of God. Now when we go to the end of Paul, did he not reveal all the counsel of God because he was ignorant of all the counsel? Or did he not reveal all the counsel of God because he was led away by the lust of the world that he did not invest enough time to do what he was supposed to do in the place of ministering all the counsel of God? If we are the place where we're asking ourselves whether he, he, he was ignorant of the whole counsel of God, then we go back to what threshold is laid on every man to know how much they know and how much is every man supposed to know. You understand? Because how much you're supposed to know determines how much you're supposed to produce. And when you're done with all of that, then it's your time to die. That's how we die. That's how we should sleep. We don't sleep because we have cancer. We have to sleep because we've done our part. So when Paul says, I have run my race, I have kept my course. He says, I'm now awaiting a crown. He says, I'm now like an offering. I'm, I'm being poured out like an offering. The place of being poured out like an offering is the place where he has now started to go behind the veil of time and the ascertaining in his spirit that he is going to pour a certain impartation to a life that is coming after his life. When people learn that kind of mindset, you realize that the counsel of God is not only limited only in the lifetime that we carry in the body. 
the gospel of God can continue out of your spirit even when you're long gone. That's why you read Psalms. That is why you read the gospel of Luke. That is why you read Jeremiah. That is why you read Malachi and it is still necessary. But there were many prophets then and there were many apostles there. But the ministry on them was not necessary to be carried on into another generation. There are men who have written books in the 20th century and the 19th century and these books are still necessary. And there are men who preached the sermon last week and people don't even remember it. Why? Because the grace upon their lives does not carry enough counsel to be qualified to minister past the veil of time. It happens with a worshiper. It happens with a preacher. It happens with a pastor. It happens with a teacher. It happens with an evangelist. It happens with everyone. That is why you need that place where you're guaranteed that the thing on you will transcend past your existence on time. But by the time you're in the body, certain things must come out of you in their own perfection to present the impression of the multiplication effect when you're gone. Hallelujah. And that is why I told people, if your counsel is short, you'll die early. If what you know about the counsel of God is short, you will die early. You'll die early. And when I'm talking about dying early, I'm not necessarily talking about uh, dying early in the body. I'm talking about dying early in the spirit. And I told people, there are people, they are alive, but they are dead. They are 25, but they are dead. They are 36, but they are dead. They are 45, but they are dead. They minister, and you feel there is something dead in them. Even the gifts in their lives can function. But when you go down into digging their spirits, they are dead men working with gifts. So people sometimes leave ministries not because they are bad people or they are immature people. No. People sense where it is life. People sense. People sense where life is. Never be deceived. It doesn't matter how much you act like that is why the book of Revelation carries a certain church that has a testimony of being alive, yet it is dead. Because the more you die in the spirit, is the more you try to qualify yourself alive by creating programs in church that create the impression that you are alive, yet you're dead. And you think, the other day I was somewhere, and a certain man of God was saying that if you don't play certain machines for young people, the church will die. So they get loud machines, wee, 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 wee. then jump, young people dance, jump, and then when they jump, they think, ooh, they're a dancing generation. They think that when you do, ooh, it was fun. When they jump, they think they're like, Continue wooing. <laughs> so when you get the little young man and tell him, okay, without the woo, what is the mystery of godliness? Um, um, what is the mystery of godliness? Um, uh, uh, of God, what is that? You know? But he's woo, woo, woo. The youth, they are alive. So they say, now let us create certain programs. What do they want? Karaoke. Bring youth to karaoke. One time I was in a church. They called me to be a guest. Me, I didn't know what they were calling me for. They called me for a show. Me, I didn't know. Me, I thought it was a normal show. Mama. I go to the church. And it's modeling. Not like this small modeling. No, the things on TV. And that day, the Kaga, the, the, there's a Kaga I will never forget. I saw many, but there's this Kaga, even now, I remember her face. It's like five years ago, but I remember her face. She had a blue dress, which was cut from around here, Sa! up to down. Barimuchi, fashion show. <laughs> and I was the man of God that day. And it, see, like you're there, and then they come like this. Then a Kazala young guy comes out with his uh, certain, certain shorts and then he's putting on things like that. <laughs> <I'm thinking. laughs> so, wait, wait. Wait a minute. Is this supposed to keep young men in charge? 
Because if that is what is supposed to keep young men in church, we have lost it. The things that have to keep us in church is His presence. That place where God is too alive in me that I can't move out even after service. But some of these men are dead. And so they try to keep certain things alive. How can, how can she have murdered? Now when I think about it, I say, I wish I slain her. How can they show me a whole apostle, man of God, separated in Kaunga? We have to bring things that the youth can what? Can it have? Because when the youth, no, no, listen. What else we shall give you, God? You stay. I promise. And you know what you guys are communicating to the world? You're telling the world we want God. We don't want fashion shows. We want God. We don't want entertainment. No, for us we want God. Call us old style. A cake, you call us anything. Our old school go money. Because we're old school got to live at all. But let us seek God. Be delivered. From thinking you must look like me. I got stumbled when I used to go to certain churches. You find the young boys, the guy is outside. He's not even there because he has come to seek God. He has come to pray a certain line on Jessica. You know, carry away. Then those broke pastors who went into full-time alley cut haircuts like this. And the guy is broke, he doesn't even have money to go back. Then he says, now, why don't I just sit at church? Perhaps I might get a prophetic thing, which is hungry. But really, in their head, they're saying, I wish you just give me 10K. Okay, would you even cut this shortcut? Because... I really don't have to prophesy in your life. I don't even know what to prophesy, but I want to prophesy because, again, man, I can't, I don't have transport. But anyway, let me just call you. Come. Um, <gasps> oh, God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. But what is really wrong? Some people have died. That is why I say it again. I repeat this before I go deeper. If the counsel of God in your life is limited, you will die early as a minister. You will die early as a minister. There are churches right now that are struggling because the brooks dried early. They are ministering, but they are struggling because the brooks dried early. They are doing everything they can they are doing advertisements on radio stations. They are doing posters everywhere. They are making everything seem fun. They will do anything. They are spending to move a God who is not in the mood. They are trying to move a God who is not in the mood. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. That is why the prophet asks, when thou art plundered, what do you do? But some of these are even too proud to ask. They're too proud to ask. Do you know the office of a minister is very deceptive? Very deceptive. Very deceptive. When men lived in the healing revival times, from about 1901, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up to about 19, um, 19, 12, and 15, and 16, almost every man in the healing revival movement healed. They healed. When men moved in the charismatic movements from about the 1930s, almost every man that moved in the charismatic dispensation during that time received of the grace. Why? Because the place of receiving is very ultimate. Desire. The best gift. And when men desired it, they received it and they functioned so effectively. But the reason as to why certain movements die and we cannot restore certain things in the lives of men is because certain men don't have a certain appreciation of the men from whom these moves came. You see, it's very easy for you to make a layman walk because you saw Pastor Isaiah make him walk. But it's another. If Pastor Isaiah has never seen the layman walk and he makes him walk. Such people, such people, such people, listen, such people teach more than you think. Such people teach more than you think. 
There are people in this world God will use as a conduit to introduce something new and different. Not new to him, but new to the earth. To certain men in the earth. For example, if you go back to the healing revival movement, who was the man to whom it sparked in the 19th? What was the spirit on that man? Because whether you want it or not, all these other altars are consequently going to have a certain grain of testimony through that altar. Because we are all a total sum of who we receive from and represent. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. There might be diversions of operations, but it is the same gift, same spirit. Same spirit. Diversities of operation, same spirit. Diversities, you, you can do it any way you want. Whether it's administration or operation or manifestation, it's the same spirit. They might change everything they want to, but it will always be the same spirit. It was a healing revival movement, and every man during that time healed in diverse ways. Hallelujah. But now let us go back to the core. From whom did God birth that flame in vision and spirit? Because when you go back to those men, you realize there's a lot of teaching, a lot of teaching that many people think. You get it? Because out of those men, both new and old flow. That is why nations that are fatherless have a big problem. Because there's a place where they, they, can't, they can't relate with certain things. Many people are the way they are. You see, some people... Some of you should understand how the mystery of lawlessness functions. Because the mystery of lawlessness, lawlessness, for example, that's what people call seducing spirits. Okay? The spirit of lawlessness produces a spirit like... I don't know if I can just define it. No, no, let me just not define it because of time. Some of you know something called doctrines of devils. Even as a doctrine of Christ. He doesn't come and say, steal. No, he doesn't speak directly. Okay? And that is why it goes deeper. When a man has led, gone into deep, into that kind of spirit, there's a Greek word they call pseudologos. Pseudologos is a place where men craftily understand the mind of speaking hypocrisy in life. They are hypocritical. They speak hypocrisy in lies, or lies in hypocrisy. They speak lies in hypocrisy. Let's call it that. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Lies in hypocrisy. Hallelujah. Because their conscience is what? Seared. When a man's conscience is seared, can I open to you something here? A mystery. There is nothing seared and it doesn't carry a brand. That is why for those of you who have done courses in brand management, I have. You realize that the first definition of branding, as of written, for those of you who have done the branding courses, you realize they represented the figure of a man putting a hot iron on an animal to identify it as his own. How many of you remember that, that picture? Do you remember? The iron there that is hot and seared leaves a brand on a man. It leaves a mark on a man. More than just the state. Certain men in the spirit realm are marked by indifference. But there is no place of marking without a certain ownership. You see, you get it? There is no brand without owning. That is why the skies are not branded. Because they are owned by God. They are automatic. They automatically yeah, owned by God. No man can say, me, I own the sky. Even now you're in Uganda, but you can't say this is Ugandan sky. Because that is God's property. You get my point? Everything you see, if you get this Bible and say, Thomas Thompson abridged reference, it is branded by Thompson. It's owned by the mind and revelation on Thompson. The annotated Bible of Death Finis, it is owned by the brand name Death Finis. That is why you realize that even the doctrines are branded 
on the lives of men from which the Lord used. Calvinism, Lutheranism, you have heard of those things? They use names. One day you hear Apostle Graceism, you know what I'm saying? Luvegaism. But you see, put your name. <laughs> it's just a point of reference to identify how certain men teach. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. It was John Calvin. He didn't dream to put an ism on his name. But there came a time where the glory on his life and what he was teaching produced a certain anointing to represent him in an ism because the name became a doing. Now some people say, ah, me, I don't believe in Calvinism. But there are some people who believe in him. Who believe in what he taught. You've heard of people they call the Brahamites. But that was from Braham or Branham. You get my point? He didn't dream that he would create a certain life of men in his name, but it was extended to those men. Whether they are wrong or they are right, the principle is branding. So a hot iron cannot be burnt and seared on a man's conscience and he's not owned by something. That's a place where men's messages are owned by the devil himself. Men's worships are owned by the devil himself. But because they speak hypocrisy in lies, you get it? The, the pre-programmed mind to be hypocritical, you understand? Has a pre-setting that can represent something up front with a back-end intention. Exoteric, endoteric. All right, you get the difference. Of course, some of you didn't make sense, but you say amen. Let's say amen. Praise the Lord. When you grow up, you'll understand. Hallelujah. So, when, when Paul speaks of, hey, trouble me not about circumcision, for in my body I bear the marks of Christ. It means that you, you can as well be branded by the Christ. Because he didn't say on my body. No, he said in my body. It's inside. It's inside. Like certain people are owned by the devil. You can be owned by God. You can be owned by God. You can be owned by God. That is what makes you a man of God or a woman of God. That's why sometimes I tell you that there, when you become a man of God, okay, pastor, preacher, wonderful, but when you become a man of God, you are branded inside by God. He owns you. When a man of God gets lost, anybody that finds him realizes he's branded of God. God let me tell you, when you grow in God and understand, like one time I was telling somebody, the day God made me, came one time and he affirmed that mark in my spirit and told me from today, Apostle Grace Lurega, I own you. There is something in my life that changed. You get my point? That place where God starts to own you, he owns you, you're his. You don't even worry about people who fight you. You don't worry about what people say about you. No. You don't even worry what people think about you. You're owned. You are owned. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a certain zeal he puts on you. There's a certain jealousy he puts on you. It, it just gets on you like this. Boy. That's why you realize anything that happens to you, there's a certain judgment he throws on you. And nothing can happen to you and he doesn't throw it. It's, it's hard. As in, he's, because he owns you. He owns you. He's jealous for you. He's jealous for you. He's jealous. There's the way he feels when people speak about you. There's the way he feels when people harm you. There's the way he feels when they treat you bad at your workplace. There's the way he feels. There's the way he feels. You don't even need to say anything, but his vengeance will be revealed. Even if, even if you, don't, you don't put your mind there, they'll fail. They always fail. They always fail. Because you belong to God. Say, I belong to God. Say it, I belong to God. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to go deep here. Because of time. Hallelujah. Because of what? Time. So, I say that you will live as long as the counsel of God revealed in your spirit or to what you've yielded yourself to. To the degrees you yield yourself to, the longer you will live. Jesus just needed three years. <laughs> and it was enough. That even if he leaves the world, thousands of years to come, the brand would still be strong. 
and still represent and still minister to men. That is where we know the anointing of God upon our lives. Every man is anointed, but not every man is anointed up to 2015. Every man is anointed, but not every man is anointed up to 2060. Every man is anointed, but not every man of God is anointed up to 2030. Every man of God is anointed, but not every man of God is anointed up to 2090. So, all of the thing on Paul, all of the thing on John, all of the thing on Peter, because many men wrote, but there's a reason why that is what God thought should exist up to 2015. And it shall exist until the end of time. Our part in the gospel is that the book of Acts is not closed. That is there we in we, wherein we also chip in. Do you know I have delayed to write? I've delayed, not because I don't have to. You know there are some people who say, hey God gave me a book. They are writing, but their books are already dead after the launch. Because some people don't see 10 years to come. They are too excited to release books. But they don't understand the spirit that has to move with those books. I will write. And will probably I even have notes already somewhere written. Things that I want to reduce one day and say, this book is about grace, this book is about faith, this book. But I want something that when, I, when a man reads it, they can read it and realize, eh, this thing will stand till the coming back of Jesus Christ. We want to give... We want to give marking guides. We don't want to set exams. Or notes. Because many men have written notes. And many men have written exams. And coursework for Christians. Let us write men. Marking guides. So when a man reads it, he says, this is an answer. It's what I was looking for. If we were not giving you answers, you'd not be coming. But you come because you get an answer every weekend. If you have 365 days, those are 365 days of answers to your question. Hallelujah. So now, Paul can be irresponsible enough and say, uh -uh, me, I'll get this and it's enough for me to distribute. Or he can really go to God and say, according to the Paul that you've created, what kind of of counsel do you think the world needs? Okay, this is this much. Okay. If it is revealed to me, how in the shortest time possible do I present this gospel? You stop wasting time. You stop wasting time. You stop wasting time. You know how people will still pray when they want, they come to church when they want. It's because when you get into their spirits, some of them, they are seared. They are seared. You can never change the way they think. They think they have more problems than anybody else. Until I open to you that there are people who walk to church from Kampala. In this church. I've seen two people walking from Kampala to come to pray. So if you think you have more problems, then you don't understand problems. Hallelujah. The people who sleep, who live below bare minimum but they find their way to church and give because they love their God now if I'm still dealing with a Christian who can't even tithe I really don't understand how you are thinking praise the good Lord Jesus you know when you start preaching and people are quiet and there's nothing as you can hear a pin drop and now you're preaching Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you're what? Now I am preaching. The other ones are just warming up. Now I am preaching. Praise the Lord Jesus. So you look at Christians and their lives are pathetic. I told people one time a story. There was somebody years ago I believed in so much because when I met this woman of God, me had never had a woman that anointed. I'd never had a woman that anointed. And she was about two years younger than me. Try to push her, push her here, push her here, push her here, push her here. Until one time I realized that there are certain people who just don't want certain things in God. They just don't want them. Now I know she's still in church, born again, serving God, serving tables. But this woman would have been so far, 
so far. So far. Let me tell you, there is a price for what you believe. It's just not bigger than the grace. Can I repeat it? There is a price for what you believe. It's just not bigger than the grace. Grace precedes it. But if that grace is availed and you don't walk that life, then you're going to die early. Christians are dead. People are walking in church, but they are dead. People are dead. All these things they say, my family is stuck, I don't have a job, I'm not married, there's nothing in my life, I don't have anything to show. It's just a counterindication of the state you're in in the spirit. It's just a counterindication. Let me tell you, you can't be a light. Let me tell you, right now, if I want $10,000, I know how to get it without begging any money now. Because of the relationship I share with God. If I say, Apostle Grace Rebecca, I want $10,000 and I get in my car, I can drive to town and come back with $10,000. Because that part in my life has, has been so dealt with. We are persuaded of greater things which accompany salvation. The place that I'm born again, there are things I'm too persuaded that they can accompany me. But yet those are the sweat and blood and the things that take time off the lives of men to seek their God. Because that would equal to a certain man working for another 10 years. Night and day, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day to get 10 or $20,000 or $30,000. Oh, so, you sweat every day. And then you realize you just go back home. And then they, they work for 20 years. And then they come back with hypertension, all these kinds of diseases on them. And then they spend all the money they worked for for 20 years to treat what got them sick because their spirits and bodies were unstable. They were busy attending, building visions of men while the vision of the Christ was seated. That is why Paul says in Timothy, we brought nothing in this world and we live with nothing. The one affirmation in our spirit that that is the thing that we go with, it is God. That is why he says goodness, godliness is contentment. The place where I have godliness. That place where God is in me. That's what contains me. That is what satisfies me. That is why God must have priority about anything. Even your co-work job. God must have priority above it. Some people, it's just marriage. The day you got children, you became different. Before you got married, you were okay. Now you're showing us that because you're married, eh, or you have children, or you even have a car. There are people who used to seek God when they didn't have cars. But when they got cars, they became funny. Some of it was like a small degree. Some of it was a master's degree. Some of it was a new job. Some of it was just small things. And they killed something in God. They killed something. That's why there are certain Christians where you can reach and ask them, what is the counsel of God for this generation? And honestly, they don't know because they've been preoccupied therein with the affairs of need. And the devil has understood how to put need in the lives of Christians all their lives that they wake up one day and they're 80 and they've not served God. You find, I've seen Christians who are in deliverance services every day for 30 years. If she got born again at 40, 30, the next 30 years of her life, again, until she's 70. All their lives, they've just been killing demons and breaking and casting and casting and destroying because the devil has known how to make men busy. He knows the place of redeeming time and he knows the place of wasting time. Because redemption of time, as I said, denotes that things eternal are going to come into the earthly plane and change the course of the world and its timing systems. But because men don't even understand and minister eternally from that plane, they are indifferent to the true, the true convictions of the Spirit. Do you think that I'm preaching right now every man is going to understand what I'm saying? No. Depending on the degree of conscience here. Some people are too burned 
that they need to listen to this sermon, this kind of sermon, like a hundred times, for them to finally say, oh, I understood. You laugh, it might be you. Younger, you think the other one is the one who is not. You know, it's very funny in the things of God. You might think you know, and then you are, you're very surprised that you didn't know. And the person you thought didn't know is the one who knows. That's why I send people that day. The people we used to see in church years ago, and we say, this one is a potential apostle. Ma, 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 ma. One year, two years, they are normal men. I mean, the little people we see in church, they seem so funny, they are rough, they are rugged, but they are growing in the ranks. 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 And these people, they don't even feel jealous. No. They are okay. They are very okay. Then this certain man of God made a mention and said, never compare yourself with anyone. No, 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 no. Even if you shouldn't compare yourself from anyone, it doesn't mean you shouldn't learn from someone. Some people, they think it means you don't learn from someone. You should learn. If you see something good in somebody, the imitations are great. That's why Paul speaks to the church of Thessalonians that because they were imitating him, they showed themselves a pattern. When you imitate, you become a pattern of the same person you want to look to. You must have somebody who inspires you. Come on. You can't be there in this world. Me, nobody inspires me. Nobody teaches me. I'm the greatest me. No, 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 no. no. Mama, Kali, you continue being the greatest you. You continue being the greatest you. I want people in my life who I want to, you understand? I want somebody, I want somebody in that they can stand on the pulpit and say something and I feel like I want to go back and seek God. I want somebody to say something and I feel like I've lost appetite. Why? Because they, that's how I grow. That, I, I love living on the edges of conviction. I just love living on those edges of conviction. I love things that just convict me in God. Because they make me a better man of God. Then they preach candy to you and beef steak. But even when you get the taste of freedom, you'll complain, Moses, take us back. For us, we used to eat meat in our bondage. Because for you, you got to a point where your testimony was meat. That God can get you out of a country of bondage and put you, want to take you to your own land. And you're not comfortable going to your own land because for years you've been too enslaved that your comfort zone is meat. Meat. Clothes, shoes, DVD players, mobile phones. Paul gets to Timothy 6.20 and tells him, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. I have given you the whole counsel of God. The Bible says he has made known unto us the mystery of his will. Now keep it jealously. Keep that which was committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called let's go to the next chapter uh, next verse sorry which some professing have what errors concerning the faith and he told him grace be with thee amen next verse chapter and verse second timothy verse, chapter one verse one uh-huh let's read because it goes i think to the next chapter isn't it? and he says but paul he says i'm paul i want you to ask to follow like he has not cut it an apostle of jesus christ by the will of god according to the promise of life which is in christ jesus uh -huh. To Timothy, my dear beloved son. That's why I told some of you yesterday, I speak to you as a father. For those of you, Amanda Bawo. So he says, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Christ be multiplied. Do you know why I speak that way? Because if you read the book of Timothy, your eyes are a son, not a father. Such books, you don't preach as a brother. Because that's not the position Paul provides for in books like Timothy. It, it's not provided for. Praise the Lord Jesus. So if you see me as a brother, I'm not talking to you. So he says, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with a pure conscience. Why is the conscience pure? Because we don't want it to be seared. That without ceasing, have I remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Listen to the prayer he's making to Timothy. Remember where he began from? Keep that which was committed to you. Just keep that which was given to you. I thank God, whom I served from my forefathers with a pure conscience, that without ceasing, have I remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. That means every night and day, Paul is praying for Timothy this prayer. If it was a necessary prayer to be consistently prayed, then every Christian needs it. 
not a one off. Okay? And he says, uh -huh, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears that may be filled, that I may be filled with joy. Uh -huh. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, I am persuaded that it is in thee also. Uh -huh. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift which is in thee by the putting on of hands. Uh -huh. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Uh -huh. But now, the, the, but not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Next verse. Who has saved us and called us with unholy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, uh -huh. but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Uh -huh. Wherefore, I am appointed a preacher, one, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles, uh -huh. for the which cause I also suffer these things. For which cause I suffer these things? Why is he suffering these things? Because of the appointment. Sometimes you might sleep hungry and still go to church because of the call of God upon your life. Another man will sleep hungry and not pray. That's okay. They were not called like you are. Stop thinking like you are like the rest. Stop imagining that because Apostle Grace has not fasted, I won't fast also. And stop thinking that your fasting is limited because of another man. No, you don't know who called you. Because of what's upon my life, I will preach every day. Because of what's upon my life, there are certain things I have to let go. Because of what's upon my life, there are certain things I have to learn to forgive. Because of the appointment, I suffer affliction. Not affliction that I probably carry a headache. But people themselves can be affliction. Situations around us can be affliction. Sometimes you don't know how to make ends meet. I remember we used to preach the gospel. There are times the rain would hit us so bad and then you go back with your feet dripping. Back at home at 2 a.m. in the morning and you find no hot water and you have to bathe by force. And then you bathe cold water and then at 7 a.m. you're up. And then one time my father looked for me for one week and he didn't see me yet I was sleeping in. Of course I had Christians who were comfortable at home watching Telemundo. They were watching what? Telemundo. Deception. Things they tell a man, cry. Ooh, no, 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 cut, cut. Not like that. Cry like, oh, and I start to cry. Oh, cry. They've, they've also cried. You see Christians. So, now I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to make myself the standard for you. I only want to tell you that some people say, oh, I want to be like Apostle Grace. But they don't know. They don't know. Some of you, if you just had a half of what we've gone through, you just go, just go down, because they change to church. Because they change to church. <laughs> You, you, it's a, you, I want to be like, do you, do you know what you mean? <laughs> or because we don't tell you, you don't, you think there are no things. There are things that we don't tell you. Because some of you, it will cause you to feel so bad. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know I've survived this three times because of the gospel? Some of you don't even know. You think every time for us we're on the pulpit, we're just on silver platter of a Nero. You understand? <laughs> you think we just arrived. There are things we've not narrated. I've not even told my spiritual father. They happened and I knew. Because there was even that awe to God that we owed him enough to say, no, it's not even important what we've been through. It's important that when we stand before God, we present the perfect Christ. <laughs> that suffices. You get my point? But now, do you see why Paul is suffering affliction? Is he suffering affliction because of the poor man? Is he suffering affliction because because they don't have jobs? There are people here. They're here every Sunday because they don't have jobs. They're in Fanero every Thursday because they need a man. But you, you, you wait when they get the man or the job. You'll see. They'll become busy. They'll become busy. That is why I celebrate men who work every day and they are still serving. Oh, God, thank you for those men. Thank you. Even if you don't clap for them, God will clap for them. Thank you for the people 
who are busy every day, have children, are married, but they still create time to serve God. And if you're here and you're serving God and you're working, I speak by the anointing upon my life. One day God will relieve you of that job. And you'll fully serve God, fully provided for, in the name of Jesus. The world won't understand, but there are ravens available. So when you're serving God, serve Him so passionately. The one time when you walk out of that coward place, you're satisfied, you served. And then get into the gospel and dig out and we win souls. And then die provided for. Without any stress. For you, you want to work for men all your life. Except if your calling is to find the gospel, you stay there. Yeah, 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 yeah. There are those people. Now for them, their calling is to what? That one, you, you stay there in your business. You have that grace. People who lose appetite and sleep when the gospel is not funded. Sadly, some of them love money. Yet that's the call of God upon their lives. I don't know how they relate. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord Jesus. So why is Paul suffering affliction? Because of the appointments. The appointments. Of course, I have some people, have people, some people say, no, in the gospel you can't be all. You can only be either a teacher or an apostle. But Paul was a teacher, an apostle, and a preacher. To the Gentiles. It was three things in one. All of that is responsibility. Hallelujah. So he says that is why he carries what? Affliction. That is why issues happen in his life. Let me tell you that things that just happen to us, not because many all these things, accusations people give on us are true, no. But because we are called. Period. And some people also add on us. But they're also part of the affliction package. But we don't forget and remember that we suffer these things nevertheless. And we are not what? Ashamed. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed for I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. So he tells the guy, hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love in Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. that, that good thing, he repeats it, which was committed unto thee, second time, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in you. That good thing. That good thing, which was committed unto you by the Holy Ghost, keep, keep it, keep it, keep it. There is something in me that keeps me alive, that persuades me that I'm going to change this world. It's inside there. I have the responsibility to keep it, to keep it, to keep it. But there are people... Christians, you just scan them and you realize there's nothing in them. Nothing. They love God. Nothing. There's nothing. 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 Yesterday, I sent a warning out and I told people there are things that are happening and that's why we're preaching the way we're preaching. Because August, the month August, is going to define a lot in this ministry. There are things that are happening right now and I feel that God is preparing certain people. But don't be surprised when in August you see replacements. In many places in this ministry. You watch. You will see it with your own eyes. Hallelujah. I'm not threatening you, no. If you're threatened, then you're threatening yourself. You get. But what I'm trying to tell you is eh, that certain things are happening in the spirit. That is why some of you recently you realize and you've lost sleep. Some of you have lost appetite. Some of you don't have peace. Some of you feel confused. Some of you, you feel like there's something drawing you into a certain place in God, but you don't know what it is. There are people here, there's a way you're feeling lately. You don't know how. You can't even sit down people to explain to them, but you feel like there's something pressing you. There's something pushing you into a certain place in God. Why? Because I feel God is breaking us for something. I feel God is breaking us for something. I feel God is breaking us for something. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us keep that which the Lord committed unto us. Let us keep it. Let us grow it. Let us multiply it. Every individual in this church, 
should start now to examine themselves. What is the call of God upon my life? What am I supposed to be doing in the gospel? Because necessity is laid upon me. Except you be reprobate. He said, examine yourself. Uh -huh. Go back to examine yourself. Whether you be in the faith. Prove your own what? Self. No, you not your own self. How that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobate. Except something ate you up and it is beyond repair. Except you a reprobate. You ought to be examining yourself as a minister and saying, now as a minister, how far have I gone? There are people sometimes I look at in church and I'm filled with tears in my heart. Because they don't know who they are. They don't know who they are. You ask the guy, why didn't you pray last week? He says, um, and the reason he gives you, you realize he doesn't know who he is. She doesn't know who she is. She doesn't know who she is. That's why sometimes I tell people, when you're really an apostle, and you're not just a preacher or a teacher, there is a way you feel about people being indifferent about God. And sometimes you have to get to the realization that certain people are not ready to change. You don't stop believing in them. No, you just keep praying for them and look for another one to raise. Just look for another one to raise. Let them watch. If by adventure one day the Lord touches them, they'll come back one day. You don't stop believing in them. Some people, we have not stopped believing in them. But the same people, we've realized that they still love a certain world. And you say, okay, let me let him do his business as he wants it. Let me wait for him. At a certain point, they always come. It might take four years. It might take 20 years. It might take 60 years. But one day they come. One day they come. It's just late, but they come. They can realize they wasted time, but they always come later on. The challenge is that sometimes they find that they are replacements. They find that there are places where they ought to be holding. There is no grace sufficient enough for them. But now they hold other places. But it is too sad when you look at someone you have preached the gospel to for one year and they are still the same old woman. The same attitude, same understanding, same prayer life, same everything. But still the same old guy. Nothing has changed about him. Nothing. 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 Some of you even got used to the presence of God. You no longer even honor the presence of God anymore because he has moved for so long in this church. For so long in this church. But now you say, ah, even if God speaks to Pastor Isaiah, now what can Pastor Isaiah stand? I don't know. What can Apostle Grace possibly say? For you, God spoke to you differently. But you examine yourself particularly yourself and ask yourself how much influence do you have in the spirit because it's equal to the responsibility you carry because I've understood time in this life I've realized that I can't even judge any man anymore because every judgment has a time perspective to it that's why Paul says judge, things, judge not things before time because you might never know which stage the person is in the learnings of God and what God is dealing with them. Either way, they end up justified in Him. I don't know how, but it does it. That's why the end of it is that every man will have praise of God. Not every man will be judged to destruction. No. There's a place where God intends that we will all have praise of God. But can you take at least a minute too and just examine yourself? Let me say it in Luganda. And there are guys who are coming in in a few months and they are coming too serious. But there are people who are coming. They are not coming to pray. They are coming to possess. And they will possess before you. You watch. You watch. You watch. Look at the faces around. And ask yourself, was this guy a year ago here? You look at the faces. Take just time. And look at the face of your neighbor and left and right and ask, was this person here last year? You're going to realize there have been many replacements, but the church has not failed to grow. It's growing. It's growing. 
There are people who are coming in because they want this God so desperate and they'll pay every price to get to him. I relate with some people. I look through. You see someone, they've come in the ministry, they are fresh, they know nothing. After three months, they send you one WhatsApp message. And then you remember there's someone who has been on your WhatsApp wall for two years and they are speaking nonsense every day. Every day. Every day. And you ask yourself, eh? I wish I can cut this and copy and paste it on somebody's wall so they can wake up. But no, sometimes you can't wake up branded men. Because they don't relate. You have finished preaching. You speak to your God. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Speak in tongues. Speak to God in your heart. Listen to me. There are people in this building that are honestly hungry for God. Praise the Lord. Don't worry, I will not tell you to put up your hand because you might lie to yourself. But I said the Lord, He's going to minister to you. If you're really hungry, that's how He'll prove. You want me to say me, I'm the hungry one? No. The power of God is coming on you where you are. The Bible says when they seek, they find. When they knock, the door is open. In the name of Jesus Christ. If you ask, you shall receive. If you're hungry, He will fill you. If you're thirsty, He will change you. Receive it, my brother. Receive it. Thank you, Lord Jesus. If you're hungry, if you're hungry, most especially for those of you who have joined the ministry about three, four months ago, if you're hungry, I feel God is feeling someone. I feel God is separating someone. I feel God is separating someone. 
I feel God is separating someone. And I just want to pray. We are too proud to receive, but that's okay. God will pour water on him that is thirsty. I promise you. I promise you. God will pour water on him that is thirsty. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And the Bible says, He shall anoint your seed. He shall anoint your message. He shall pour water on your message. He shall distribute the Spirit on what comes out of you. Receive it right now in the name of Jesus. Take it, 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 I love you. I see a double portion. You are everything to me and I. Triple! It's so true. somebody in this room your life is about to take a dramatic turn oh, some people are going to look at you in one month from now and they're not going to be able to recognize you I sense a separation right now that is as we were separated years ago the same way some of us were separated years ago, I feel the same separation on somebody's life. So, so, there's a very heavy anointing. I see an apostolic mantle in this room like I've never seen in my life.
This guy has a great call of God upon his life. You have a great call of God upon your life. Great. I mean so great. So great. I've not seen it many men. So great. I don't know why, but I feel a separation today. I don't. There's somebody today you're closing a seven chapter in your life. You're closing a seven chapter in your life. It's closing literally. I don't even need to lay a hand on you. God has been desperate for this. Father, we thank you. I receive it myself. We receive it, God. We receive it, God.